always kind of you know pushed the uh, technological edge. When we created the Toilet Save Christmas, there were some uh, dramatic changes in uh, production values. Toy was a pretty big step for us. The big difference between Toy and uh, the ones before this is we tried for a grander scope. The Toy That Saved Christmas was, was significantly more ambitious than the films we had done before it. I was the second person that Phil hired. Back then we had, uh, there was only like eight of us. I was the ninth employee, and there were still only, you know, ten of us, the same number that we had just done, I think, Dave and the Giant Pickle um, was before that, right? Right, right, right. Which is yeah, a much simpler, yeah. much simpler show. So we kind of killed ourselves uh, to get it done on time. I remember a heat and no sleep. It was a screw factory. And smelled the cutting oil that was in the air. A one-story... Uh, brick, completely sealed, you can only get in through the doors, screw factory. The guy who had built the factory had actually spent way too much on his front offices for scale to the factory itself, so he went out of business. <laughs> he went bankrupt. I think it was the shag carpeting and the... Yes, I know. mean, he, he built himself his own, you know, big wood paneled office, very 60s, uh, with lime green uh, linoleum tile all over the place, and then his office had shag carpeting, uh, real wood paneling, his own bathroom, personal bathroom, and so he went out of business because he spent too much. Don't forget about the drapes. On his office. Oh, the drapes. Drapes to die for. It yep, was, it was yep. all very kind of, you know, Austin Powers. And we actually packed uh, FedEx packages, you know, in, in, in the office, sent them to people. People would open them up and say, that smells like your office. <laughs> it's like, so we were shipping yeah. this... Uh, <laughs> Ship the smell. Yes, <laughs> shipping the smell across the country. Jim and Jerry... Ben, I'm bored. The landlords uh, wanted to change the air conditioning unit on the roof of, of the aforementioned screw manufacturing plant. And so, and this is in September, summer was ending, so they walk in the door in September, go to the woman who was working our front desk at that time and say, would now be a good time to shut down the air handling for the year? And she looked around. <laughs> and it was a cool day on <laughs> And it was a cool day. day. Yeah. <laughs> and said, I think so. <laughs> and then they turned around and walked out. We never heard of this conversation. It was, it was never, never <laughs> relayed to us. Uh, two days later, the air conditioning turns off. Then we get a heat wave. So we've got a heat wave in September heading into October. We've got 10 people working on computers trying to finish a show. It's 110 outside. And, you know, it's 85, 88 degrees, you know, in the office. I went out and I bought a bathing suit. And I was sitting there working in the bathing suit. But and that's where green linoleum comes in handy, because it yes. stays quite cool, you know. Green so you can linoleum. actually cool off on the linoleum if you lay down flat. When it got too hot, I would just go out to the atrium with the linoleum floor and sit there, lie down on the floor where it was cooler, and start making sweat angels in an attempt to dump heat. Well, everyone who's made a snow angel can pretty much figure this out. It's the same process, except you're leaving a puddle as opposed to an imprint. Sooner or later, we developed a infestation of mice. Sometimes it seemed like they were everywhere. We had flypaper set up. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that was to catch mice or not. Finally, we actually caught a mouse, which kind of scared us a lot because the mouse was still alive. Only he had this one foot that was caught in the uh, tape, and so he's kind of trying to get away, but he's dragging this big piece, this eight and a half by 11 piece of sticky paper that's got a bunch of roaches stuck to it as well. So we all looked at each other. In fact, I think Robert Ellis was the one who said, well, you know, we can't kill this mouse. And I'm going, uh, well, that's what most people do with mice. And he said, no, 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 we got to liberate the mouse. We have to free the mouse. I'm going, Robert, we've been trying to catch this mouse. No, we have to free the mouse, free the mouse. So we decided we would take the trap and march it three, with the mouse on it and march it three blocks south and carefully unstick the mouse while singing Born Free and <laughs> And the mouse would sort of stickily scuttle off into the underbrush, and we would go back to work. It dawned on me that this company was definitely unusual when we were in the last week or two of the show. And, of course, it's a Christmas show, so you can't ship it late. You know, there's no, no shippy lady <laughs> on a Christmas show because no one...
for Groundhog's Day, people do not buy Christmas videos. <laughs> so we had to get it done on time. Uh, we ended up, you know, working around the clock. The reason there was this night shift was because the uh, the computers we only had three or four computers that we could actually work on. They just wouldn't leave the office. They just had to get the show finished. I have a very distinct memory of, of stepping over a sleeping animator in the mm -hmm. hallway to get to the edit room, you know, so we could try to finish the show. So there, mm -hmm. was, there were just people lying on, you know, pieces of foam rubber on the floor right. <laughs> trying to sleep while we were getting it done. We called it the Noni Foam, remember? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> my wife, my, my uh, mom's name is Noni, or Nona, Noni for short, and she had all these old foam things that she, you know, used to use under her mattress or whatever, and I, you know, inherited them somehow, you know, and brought them to work, and, you know, yes, everybody laid on the Noni Foam. <laughs> it was uh, a harrowing time. Um, I remember people laid out on the floor uh, the, the very last day, including Phil. Um, <laughs> We're all just like crashing. I was still working full time at, at a church as a director of music. So I would work my full day at my other job, come home, and at that point my studio was in a spare room in our house. It didn't even have a door, it was just kind of off of our dining room. So I had it half filled with music equipment. So 10 o'clock at night or whenever Phil was done with his work at the office, he would come over. So we had a, a, a lot of very late nights into the morning trying to get the score done. And then he'd, you know, have to get a few hours sleep and go back and go to his regular office. At this one point, uh, there was an announcement made, and I've been there for 28 hours now, and uh, this announcement comes over our phone intercom. Uh, the final shot will be rendered in an hour. And I look at my clock, and it's like midnight, and I'm thinking, an hour, gee, that's going to be 1 a.m. So I get on the train, and... Um, the stop before downtown goes right by our offices. And so I'm looking at the window, I look outside, and I notice as we go by the offices, every one of the employees' cars are still there. Look at my watch, it's quarter of nine. We had gotten so close to, so close to the time we had to have this thing delivered that we had, we had to put Bridget, our administrator, secretary, uh, sort of catch-all person, we were going to have to put her on a flight and fly her down to Dallas, Texas, so she could deliver it by hand. FedEx wasn't fast enough. The tape left. Bridget headed to the airport. Um, she caught her flight. She got down to Dallas, handed the tape to the duplicator. It went off, and they started making copies of the toy that saved Christmas. Meanwhile, the rest of us just kind of collapsed. Everybody went home. Um, but that night, about midnight, Phil Vischer, Bob the Tomato, wakes up with these terrible chest pains. He thinks he's having a heart attack. Lisa Vischer, his wife, Junior Asparagus, takes him to the emergency hospital. It takes him about three hours to figure out, well, no, it's not a heart attack, but actually a bacteria, because he's so depleted his body, his, is attacking his heart. And uh, they send him home and put him in bed. He has to stay in bed for about a month and then, uh, now that he's rested up, we're, we're thrilled he's alive. We know that's just terrific. But as soon as you get well, could you write the next script? The Toy That Saved Christmas was a watershed film for us because mm -hmm. we had never attempted anything limbid before. You know, mm -hmm. we just had vegetables. In The Toy That Saved Christmas, the penguins, mm -hmm. which I didn't appreciate at the time as a real dramatic production improvement, but they had arms and legs. I mean, they had <laughs> wings and legs, featherless wings, albeit. So the animators really started getting into, okay, give us some arms and legs, you know, anything with arms and legs, mm -hmm. um, which led to, okay, you want it? Here it comes. <laughs> but saw Louie, a little a jointed toy, and then uh, ultimately, you know, the, the penguins. Tom Danen at one point had the scene where Louie first steps out of the warehouse and, and slips and tumbles down the stairs into the snowball. And, and he was just laboring over this, you know, what, how does this have to look and everything. And he finally, um, he saw a Jackie Chan movie, and he saw one point where, where Jackie's just like flying through the air, um, but his arms are windmilling and his legs are kicking, and it was just this, the, the perfect action fall. So that's, that's where Tom got this inspiration to, to, to give Louie the Jackie Chan fall. So that's what it became from then on. Jackie Chan. <laughs> 
I didn't realize how difficult that was because of our software that we were using. I mean, actually animating appendages really slows down the process. It's why we use vegetables. And, and it was actually on this show, The Toy That Saved Christmas, that one of our vegetables, for the first time, acted with his shoulders. That's right. And That's vegetables right. don't have shoulders. But mm -hmm. Mr. Nezer shrugs. Mm -hmm. And as Ron Smith was the animator. It's just the scene where, the again, the townspeople confront Nezer, and he's kind of, you know, oh, I don't know, <laughs> what are you talking about? I don't know what you're doing. And I just put this little chuckle thing in there, and because his uh, he was more costumed than most of the other characters, he had his little shirt and tie and his, his pants, but just be, because I had that to kind of make visible the, the edges of his relatively spherical shape going up and down, it, it, it was this groundbreaking moment of, of vegetable lesbianism. And I just remember watching that, like, what? What? Play that again. <laughs> <laughs> How did you make him shrug? He doesn't have shoulders. Quite, quite some acclaim I gained with that one. So it was on this show that you know the animators really started pushing the animation to a level beyond what I had conceived. When Nezer has them all tied up on the sled at the end before he sends them to their doom, um, the ability of the computer to animate, like do secondary animation, if you move this character, having the rope move with him was impossible. He couldn't do that. So if, if you watch the show and you're like, eh, that rope's not really around them that tight, they could get out of there. Just just please remember that we haven't finagled that rope after, you know, they're moving every character. It's, uh, good thing they're tied down and they can't move too much, but even then it was still pretty, pretty big chore.